My name is Bella, and I came with my cousin Kimberly. Oh, uh, okay. Does she have to drag you here? No? No, okay, that's good. Give it back to her. And, uh... My name's Christina, and Kim brought me here. Kim? Yeah! Uh, yeah. Wow, did, did she buy you like steak dinner to get you here? No? I wish. Oh, next time you gotta uh, make sure she gets steak dinner. And your name is? Delino. Delino. And who brought you? Anthony did. Oh, he didn't bribe you, did he? Okay, everything's legal. Alright. Give, give our guests a hand. Uh, you, they're brave for coming. You they must be brave for coming. Here. Okay. I'm going to show you guys a short video clip. Hey! 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 I don't know if everyone's there on Friday, but I didn't have my voice. I was feeling very sick. And then everyone prayed for me. And the next day I woke up, I didn't feel as sick. And now my voice is completely better. Yeah, awesome. Did, did anybody else get a feeling? Well, Friday, I was crying hectically because I was scared. Um, and then Christine, everyone prayed for me, and I went home and I finally got a good night's rest. That's awesome. Were yeah. okay. and peace. Yeah. And peace. Yay. Yay. I really just appreciate you. And I don't know, I, you're like such an amazing person. And Donna, go give her a hug, will you? She's so crying. She's crying. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what's wrong with crying, you girl? It's you. See, this is, this is good. Then you can cry too. See you guys, and I've, I've been seeing you guys grow so much and be so open to God and Nicole. It's like you're brand new. And like, to watch you grow, I mean, I knew you were going to go fast, but you're growing so fast. And all of you guys, Jerry, oh my gosh, how long have you been here? Like seriously, like all of y'all, I'm so proud of you guys. And Esther, I have to call you out because, you know, it's funny because you have been here, you know, such a long time. And, you know, it's like you're growing up in front of my face. And, you know, I've always said that you are like one to watch. You know, and I'm watching, and I know that, you know, is it the, the very first most important thing? No, the first thing is intimacy, but I know that you're going to walk in signs and wonders. And I, I'm just like, you know, I'm so amazed by you. And you're so, um, you have so much peace, and you're so stable. And uh, anyways, I'm really proud of you. And Donna, Donna just had a major breakthrough. I know you may not want to talk about it, but I'm so <laughs> proud of you. Like, Seriously, and Caroline, you have fought through so much stuff, and y'all are just growing. I just want to thank you guys for letting me be a part of your life. So, um, Stephen, I just want to say that I'm sure I'm not the only one here. That I'm very thankful for you for all the time that you put out for me, for us. <laughs> For all the money you cut out for us, for all so time is a big one. Time is a big one. <laughs> I know that it takes a lot for someone to raise a kid, to, for someone to be there when we're broken, when we're growing up, when we make mistakes, and when we love on you, and you're you're still there even even though we're not perfect. And you taught me the value of fighting for someone you love really war for them so that we can be a family together. You taught me what it means to have a family. If I want you guys to catch anything about all this, 
is that we have to fight for each other. Especially when somebody is angry at you, you have to fight to love that person. Honor that person when they're angry. Honor when they misunderstand you. And 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 fight for for love. And all of a sudden, when they snap out of it, you have the best of friends. Then like the sun after all of the rain is gone. The morning without any cloud comes with a picture of your love. Okay, uh, Kevin, where are you? Come on up here, buddy. Woo. Kevin has a really awesome poem yeah. that was written from his heart. And when I heard it, I said, Kevin, you got to read this because this is good stuff. God's doing something inside of you and you're letting you're writing it down on paper. How many of you guys want to hear what he's got? Okay. All right. I want you to okay, I want to pray for him because I want him to read it from his heart and not feel any shyness or any kind of weird. You know, performance thing, okay? How many guys don't want him to perform up here? How many guys want him just to talk from his heart, okay? So, Lord, stretch your hands. Lord, would you give him freedom right now? And uh, don't let him try to perform to impress anybody. Lord, I just speak from his heart. God, I just pray for your anointing on this poem in Jesus' name. The one thing I want to hear most is my mom say, that's my son. I'm so proud of him. He has grown into a such a man. And here I stand, broken with a sense, without a sense of belonging, wondering what God has called me to do. My heart is aching and it is crying, longing for an attention that is so rightly deserves, as a son, as a brother. And the question I ask God is, love who? The, thinking that I have to give a love that I thought was never given to me. And here God stands with arms wide, open wide, that says, reserved. Reserved for who? Reserved for the ones who are weary and broken. Reserved for you. Reserved for me. And I look within myself and see this dirtiness, this filth that won't go away. I see the heart that has been ripped, torn, thrown away, and forgotten. Why does God want someone like me? Just leave me be. I'm not worth it. You will leave me just like my dad has left. And as I pushed, pushed the concept of a loving God, a God who would never leave me or forsake me, my heart began to grow distant. I turned the opposite way and ran. He chased me down, seeking me, longing for me. He found me. In, in the pit of darkness full of self-hatred, full of nothing but misery, full of bitterness and loneliness. I shield my heart, my fragile heart, and he still sees it. The light of his face brings me to my knees, and I offer him my heart. My heart is covered in cracks. The hole where a father's love and where a mother's nurturing should be is enlarged. And, and pieces of my heart crumble within my hand. My, my hand starts to shake, and I, mu I mutter my words of caution. I give you my heart. Please don't break it. Please don't. He takes my heart and he takes my hand. He lifts me up. He examines my heart and smiles. This is a perfect heart. I see my heart restored, renewed, and whole again. He lays down in a green pasture and holds me close, and I rest my hand on his chest. Abide in me, son. Abide in me. For I long and I seek after your heart. I have found and found rest. I am proud of you, my son. This is my son for growing well, please. What Kevin doesn't know is it plays right into what I'm going to share. It's really cool. In 1997, the winter, the end of the winter of 97, I was, yeah, I was back in the county jail after three, almost three years of doing federal time. And uh, I, you know, everything that Kevin read, broken heart, torn to pieces, you know, hysterical, crazy, suicidal, I've gone through all that and I had no hope. Uh, I was just in a place where, you know, I could kill somebody and not care, you know. That's where I was. And I got desperate and began to just cry out to God. Like, I didn't know Him, but I was like, God, help me. And didn't believe in Him either, you know. I had a lot of religion, knew about Him, but I always thought, he was angry at me. How many of you guys ever thought that God was angry at me? Let me tell you, because of Jesus, all the anger that God has towards sin, 
and sinful man has been laid on the body of Jesus, he no longer can be angry at you if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So in this place, I met some guy. He prayed for me, and I had an encounter with God. This guy just laid hands on me and began to tell me my past, my present, my future. And I thought, dang, are you some kind of psychic or something? You know, how do you know? And the Lord... Um, spoke to him about me. I don't know how that happened at the time. I didn't understand it. And he said, tell me about the dream you're going to have. And so I'm not going to tell you the whole dream. But Jesus appears to me that night and spoke to me audibly. Everybody say audibly. audibly. Did you know that God can speak to you audibly in a dream? You actually hear a man talking to you. How many guys want that? And let me ask you something. Did I do anything to deserve it? No. Did I do a lot of religious, hyperactive, religious activity? No. I just simply let somebody pray for me. Some of you guys just need to let people pray for you sometimes. You know? So when I, he prayed for me, God invaded my dream. Anyway, make a long story short. The words that I heard audibly were, where have you come from? And where are you going? Now these words still, these are eternal words, guys. These words, I'm still wondering about these words, okay? And so this question still provokes me today. I'm provoked by these words, okay? Now, when God asks you a question, is it because he doesn't know the answer? Let me tell you what it is, why he asks you a question. It is an invitation to intimacy. It is an, in, he is inviting you to know his heart, to be one with him, to have deep, intimate communion with him. That's what he like. That's what he wants in us. Okay. So, what does this answer look like? And I'm going to try tonight to finally define some of what I believe through these years. I got, uh, through my experience with God, to answer most, I can't fully answer this question, I don't think anybody can, but I'm trying to tonight, okay? John 8, 14, I'm going to read it real fast, you don't have to turn there for now, okay? This is the Amplified Bible. Jesus answered, and he's answering to the Pharisee, and he says, even if I do testify on my own behalf, my testimony is true and reliable and valid. For I know where I came from. And I know where I'm going. But you do not know where you come from. Or where you're going. And he's talking to the Pharisees who know the Bible. But didn't know God. He says, I know where I came from. I know where I'm going. Do you know where you came from? And do you know where you're going? Okay. Well, if you turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, you don't have to go there because uh, I'm going to go real fast. And the Lord God formed man of the dirst, dirst, dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Now, every creature God spoke into existence, man, he came close and formed our... He formed you, okay? He formed us. Man, talking about Adam. And when God breathed his very breath into man, he gave man a part of himself. So man and God became one. This means that you are able to have intimate communion with God, perfect fellowship with God. God would come to Adam in the cool of the day and, in, and Adam and God would have encounters, meetings. This is the origin of what man was made for. This is why you're alive. You were made to dwell with God, to live in his presence, to know him, to commune with him, to have two-way conversations with him, to walk with him in the cool of the day, and to encounter him. Well, the garden now is your heart. And he cultivates, he wants you to cultivate this garden 
so you can have an encounter with him. This is why you're alive. Everybody say, this is the purpose of my existence. Everybody say that. I was made to dwell with, to encounter, to have two-way conversations with God. And to know him intimately, personally, first person, okay? Experience his voice, know his heart. And when somebody asks me what he's all about, it just flows out of me like a river. Okay? How many guys want that? Sometimes you don't have to say, you just lay hands on them and something flows out of you like a river. It's the power of God. Okay? So this is where I came from. Everybody say, this is where I came from. I came from God. His very life came into me. Into Adam. I am, everybody know you're a seed of Adam, right? Adam is your greatest grandfather. Now, we all know that sin came into the world. Adam sinned. We were separated from God because of sin. Now, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Let me explain. I don't want to use fancy words, Christianese words that some of you new people don't understand. Jesus purchased you and I with his very life. He was crushed by the wrath of God. It pleased God to crush his son so he can look at you in the face and say, I love you and accept you if you will accept what I did for you by faith. Do you guys understand that? And you receive this gift. To enter into this garden once again. Everybody say, I'm coming back into the garden. Now, where are you going? This is something I'm going to talk about tonight that's going to take a little longer, okay? Revelations, you can turn here if you want. Revelations 21 verse 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Jesus wants to restore creation, the earth, the existence of man back to the way it started out in the garden where God and man had complete unbroken fellowship. Do you know why you long for love and acceptance? Do you know why your heart is never fulfilled even though you go to get entertained or you... You find, uh, you know, you, you win the biggest prize and you find all these earthly accomplishments. Do you know why there's still something missing? Because that's not why you're alive. You're alive to encounter God. Everybody say, I'm alive to encounter God. That's why you'll never be happy and never be complete. If you get the girl, the guy, if you get the car you wanted, the position you wanted, it still will never satisfy you. The new Jerusalem is when heaven comes down to earth. There is a day that's coming, I believe very soon, perhaps even in your lifetime. There's a day coming soon, very soon, where heaven is going to come to earth. Jesus comes back with his rewards for you and I, and we will be changed at the twinkle of a the twinkling of an eye, like that, from these physical bodies to resurrected bodies, glorified bodies, perfect bodies, everybody say, incorruptible. You won't have a desire to sin in this body. Okay. He's going to give you this body, and it's coming really soon. And then, for a thousand years, we rule with him. And our job is to restore with him the earth back to the way it was in the Garden of Eden. And then here's the thing. I'm going to read this to you, okay? So you believe me. I mean, believe that it's in the Bible, okay? Revelations 21.3 says, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Did you hear what I just read? God the Father, one day, is going to dwell with you and I. You never heard that in a 
message, right? This is what he wanted in the beginning. And he's going to have what he started out with. So this is where we're going, guys. Everybody said, this is where I'm going. This is where I'm headed. Okay. So why do we waste time in this temporary... If, you're, if you eat right, you might live a hundred. Right? For billions of years, you're going to dwell with God. Everybody say, I'm going to dwell with God. But he's calling us to start now, while we're on earth, to experience him as a way of life here, so we can bring his heart to the nations. How many of you guys want to experience and encounter God here? It starts here, and you'll have billions of years to continue this Knowledge, this, this quest to find out who he truly is and how much he really likes you. Acts 3.20 And that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the time of restoration of all things. There is a time where everything is going to be restored. The earth is going to be restored. Everybody say the earth is going to be restored. You know, you, you hear about the end of the world, you know. And there's even a song, It's the end of the world. It ended when you said goodbye. There is no end of the world. There's the end of the age. The end of human history. And Jesus comes back and he establishes his kingdom on earth. And the earth goes on. You guys like that? You're not going to be up in a cloud playing a harp. That's like silly. Makes people not want to go to heaven. It's a lie. Like, what am I going to do? Play a harp all my life? That's silly. No. The knowledge of God is infinite. It, you're going to have billions of years to, and you'll never come to the end of who He is. You'll never come to the end. He's infinite. There's going to be a day when Satan. Even if you read Revelation chapter 3, it's going to be driven off the earth. How many of you guys like that day? Okay. Satan's going to be out of the earth. That's when Jesus begins to prepare the earth for God himself to come back. And the supernatural and the natural will be one. And you guys are going to look gorgeous in your resurrected bodies. Okay. Some of you guys say, I look gorgeous already. <laughs> Watch out. No, okay. <laughs> okay. Now, I got to tell you, though, before those days, before that time, though, there is going to be an increase of darkness and wickedness like no one has ever seen in the history of the human race. It's already, you can see it around you, it's increasing. But it's going to escalate. It's going to get so bad, so terrible, that in certain places of the earth, they're going to give in to Satan worship and such immorality like you've never seen in the history of the human race. But God's people are going to rise and be the light in the darkness. And I believe, you know, that, that, that there's places that are going to shine so bright, but there's going to be places that are still giving them over to Satan and darkness. But then... That's when Jesus comes and destroys all the darkness. Do you guys do you guys like this stuff, or should I talk about something softer? Okay, okay. No more milk. Okay. Now, who told you? Now, here here's the thing that people wonder about. Okay. Nobody has ever been resurrected from the dead, besides those that are written in the Bible. Jesus. And some of the other people, okay. All the saints that have died, they're still in the grave. But they have a body. But it's not a resurrected body yet. Because they don't need that body. Unless Jesus comes back, heaven comes to earth, and they need that body to be on the, in, in the new Jerusalem when we rule and reign with Jesus in our physical, natural, resurrected bodies. Okay, Do you guys get what I'm just saying? Okay, so a lot of your your friends or family that have died, they don't have their resurrected bodies yet. Okay, but that when Jesus comes back, they receive that body because why do we need that body? Because we have work to do. Everybody say we got work to do. Jesus said, 
John 13, 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and he had come from God, here again, and was going to God. What about this? Okay. Rose from his supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel with which he girded himself. This is the God-man. This is God in the flesh. He knew where he came from. He knew where he was going. He had no doubt who he was. He knew that he was a son of God. See, when you know who you are as a son of God, you don't have a problem getting on your feet to wash them, getting on your knees to wash somebody's feet. Because you know who you are. And he said, the greatest among you is the servant of all. When he said that, he was talking about himself. He can pretty much say, I am the greatest among you. But I chose to get on my knees and feet and serve you. When you know who you are, it's not really hard to be humble. The only people that won't humble themselves are those who don't know who they are. They don't know where they came from, and they don't know where they're going. Even though they have intellectual knowledge of it in their mind, the depth of their heart, the core of their being, has not really accepted this truth. So they're busy trying to be somebody because they don't know who they are. Did you get what I just said? The reason why I want you to be able to answer this question from the core of your heart is because this is what frees you from insecurity, from pride and selfishness. And you can allow yourself to walk in humility. You know what humility is, right? Love and humility is two sides of the same coin. I am humble so that I can express the words and the deeds of love to you. Humility is the attitude of genuine love. And when you already know who you are, it's not hard to humble yourself. It's the, the people who are insecure and uh, who are insecure, don't know who they are, have a, a, an identity crisis that cannot humble themselves to even receive prayer, to even say, I'm sorry, to say, I need help. Do you know why it's so important to answer this question tonight? Am I getting what I'm saying? I know that the Lord gave me this, this, this simple question to answer tonight for you guys. Because I was praying about this and this came to me. And I, I want to submit it to you. And if you believe this is God and you receive this, I believe something's going to happen inside of you, okay? The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time, right? Now, does God want to exalt you? Everybody say yes. yes. He just doesn't want you to exalt yourself. If you know who you are, you don't need to exalt yourself. You don't need a big title in front of your name like a lot of preachers want. Whoa, did I hit somebody hard? You don't need to be the guy in charge of the worship team to feel important. You don't need to have the best sermon to look like you're so spiritual, right? You don't need to have lots of money to feel important. A nice car make you feel better about your profile. You don't need to prove nothing to nobody because you already know you're somebody in the eyes of Almighty God. Get it? Yeah. I know where I came from. I know where I'm going. Amen. What you think about me is really small compared to what he thinks about me. And his opinion matters because I don't live for your opinion. I live for the pigeon of the King of Kings who owns the universe. And he owns me and he owns you too if you realize that. Amen. So I know who I am. Do you know who you are? <laughs> then why don't you humble yourself? See, answering this question will allow you to be known for who you are. I want to talk about something that um, Crystal, she's not here, was talking about, but I want to add my two cents into it. I hope it's not just mine. I hope it's the Holy Ghost. Okay. I believe it's the Holy Ghost. Okay. 
I want to talk about our purpose. Now, I believe that if you can answer the question that I started out with, where have you come from and where are you going, you will know your purpose. And your, your purpose is not your calling. Let me start with the Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 3. Listen, guys. Tonight, this simple truth can actually change your life from now on. I believe that. If you catch this. But Stephen, you say that a lot. Because I believe the truth can change you if you let it. Every time you hear truth, you catch it. It will change you forever. For billions of years. And trillions, okay? Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 3. I am my beloved, my beloved mine, and his desire is for me. I sang it, because it's a song of Solomon, but it's the truth that I'm singing. Everybody say, I am a lover of God. I am a lover of God. I am loved by God. And say, so that makes me very successful. Before I accomplish anything else in man's eyes, in my in front of my friends, in front of my family, I'm already successful because the God, the creator of the universe, calls me his. He says, you belong to me. You are mine. I will take care of you. I am your reward. What else do you need? What other exterior forms are, is necessary that you need to be successful? If you don't graduate from high school, you're still successful as far as eternity. Bill Gates is not as successful as you are. All these movie stars, Oprah Winfrey, all these rich billionaires, if they didn't belong to Jesus, they're not as successful as you. Everybody can claim that right now. Just say, I am already successful. Now, if I do anything that causes people to see me as successful, that really doesn't matter. I can still do it. It's still good. But that doesn't make me successful. Get it? Okay. So if my mom wants me to be a doctor and I don't become a doctor, but I go and preach the gospel and do what God tells me to do, and my mom calls me a loser, is she right or wrong? She's wrong. Whose words are you going to believe? Okay. Now, I'm not saying that so you can dishonor your parents, okay? It's just an example, okay? I am not defined by my failure or by my accomplishments. Say, everybody say that. I am not defined. This is so important right now. By my failure or by my accomplishments. The world defines you that way, right? Your, your parents defined you by that way, right? Everybody say amen. That, that happened to me over and over. Your friends defined you by that way, right? Okay. I am not despised by God. Everybody say, I am not despised by God, nor am I a hypocrite because of my weaknesses. Who has weaknesses? Okay. God does not despise you because of your weaknesses, okay? We must live by our spiritual identity. What is our spiritual identity? What you look like to God. He says, you are my perfect one. Thou art fair, my beloved. Thou art fair. King James Version. Thou hast dove's eyes. That means your focus on me is real. You have peripheral vision. You're not distracted. Your eyes are like dove's eyes. You are beautiful to me, my love. You are beautiful. Hear this. If your heart, if you're sitting here and you say, God, I want you, and maybe you struggle to see God even, maybe you have desire to see God, but you struggle daily, I want to declare to you, and the Lord says, hear me, you are beautiful and I like you. I enjoy you in your weakness, in your struggle. You belong to me. I will take care of you. I am yours and you are mine. 
I mean, if you can take that as it from the Lord, your spirit will come alive. And be awakened to deeper love, okay? Okay. So, how do you want to identify yourself? The way God sees you? Or the way man sees you? The way God sees you, right? So, you want to know that you are loved by God and you're a lover of God. You're accepted by God in your weakness. I say this over and over because I want you to get this. Because pretty soon when you walk out of here... The whole worldly system is going to redefine you. And you're going to have to cast those lies down. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. This is why you're alive. I say it and I'll say it again. The reason why you live and breathe. Your purpose to be a lover of God. To know that you are loved by God. You are important to God for who you are and not what you do. Everybody say, I'm important to God for who I am. I am his beloved. I am the one that he likes. I am the one that he enjoys right now. I am the one that he's thinking about. I am the one that he pursues. I'm the one he's committed to. I'm the one he chose. He knew me, Sammy, before you were formed in the womb. He knew you. Okay? That little video made some people cry. Because a lot of people didn't know that God was thinking about them. They believed their mistake, their accident. And this has everything to do with Kevin's poem earlier, okay? You can only love God to the degree that you know He loves you. The measure of love you have for God can only be that which you have received from Him. And that comes by gazing at His beauty. That comes by seeking Him in the place of prayer and in the Word of God. That comes by sitting here and not allowing yourself. Did you know you can allow yourself to be distracted like that? Yeah. There's, I know there's a lot of pretty girls here. But you guys don't need to look at them right now. <laughs> and there's a lot of handsome guys right now. In here. But you know what? They are not important to you right now. Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine says. And the second commandment is. Like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. The first one is your purpose. And the second one is your call. Did you get it? Your purpose is to know, to dwell, to encounter love. God is love. To know how he feels about you. To have communion with him. And let him exhilarate your heart. Let him awaken love in you. So you can take that, that is your call, and give it to others. And this is why you're alive. Everybody say, this is why I'm alive. Because if it's not why you're alive, you're going to need a big house, a nice car, a big platform. You need everybody to look and pay attention to you because you don't know who you are. When you, if this is the reason why you're alive, you know who you are. You don't need any of that. You can be happy alone in your room with no one around in the presence of God, feeling his heart on yours, being filled with the fullness of who he is and his whispers to you and receive the kisses of his word into your heart, becoming one with him. And you delight in that and you will be Able to do whatever he asks you to do. Romans 1.1 1, 1. Paul, a bondservant. That's the word downlos. It means a love slave. Okay? Of Jesus Christ. Called to be an apostle. Did you notice that he called himself a love slave? And he says, but I'm called to be an apostle. 
My calling is an apostle, but that's not who I really am. I am a love slave. My purpose in life is not to do apostolic ministry. Like It's not why you're alive. It's what you do while you're alive. But while you're alive, okay, is the first commandment. Back in those days, a Daulos is somebody is a slave who served seven years. I mean, who served six years. On the seventh year, they can go free. But instead of going free, they chose because they love their master to be a slave for life. And so, they put an ear, a hole in the left ear, and put a gold ring in that ear, and that that ring is a symbol of a Daulos or a love slave. To the church of Ephesus, if you can go there in Revelations 2, 1 through 5. I know your works. You have persevered and labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. So Jesus is saying, hey, you're doing a good job. I know what you're doing. You've labored. You've gone through much and you haven't become weary. You're faithful. Okay. Nevertheless, I have this against you. Hey, when, when the Son of God has something against you, you're going to pay attention, right? Okay. What does He have against you? That you have left your first love. You're forgetting your purpose. This church is in revival. This church, there's a lot of people coming, a lot of good things happening, and they got so busy doing ministry, trying to take care of everybody, they forgot their purpose. And Jesus comes and says, Hey, I, you've done a lot of good stuff. But you know what? That's not why you're alive. You were made to love me. And I'm jealous for you. I want you in my presence. I want you to come to me. Before you go to people. You are called to be before you are called to do. This is why you're alive. And he rebukes them. How many guys need a rebuke like that from Jesus sometimes? Okay. Remember therefore where you've fallen. Where you've backslidden. Whoa, wait a minute. Jesus, I am doing the work of the ministry. I'm on Facebook trying to get everybody saved. What do you mean I'm backslidden? <laughs> Did you guys get what I just said? Yeah. I'm trying to get the whole world saved. I'm backslidden. What? I'm doing all these good works. I got so many people saved last month. You know, I'm feeding the poor. I'm taking care of discipling people. That is not your purpose. That is what you're called to do. But first thing first, and the Lord rebukes you for getting mixed up with why you're alive. I, Paul, a bondservant, a love slave, I'm a lover of God, and I'm loved by God, called to be an apostle, I'm called to be an apostle to, to start churches and to build churches. But that's not who I am. And I don't need a big title in front of my name. I just want to be a lover of God. If you want to give me a title, call me a love slave to Jesus. Remember, therefore, where you've fallen, repent. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand. The lampstand speaks of the influence, the light, the anointing. He can take all your ministry away because he wants you. Did you know that sometimes he will take your ministry away because he's so jealous? For you? Now, I thought ministry is good. It is good. But if you want the real kind of ministry, if you want to really minister the way that he wants you to, it's your heart connected to him and out of the overflow of intimacy with God, you'll bring life everywhere you go. That's what he's jealous for. You guys get that? 2 Corinthians 11.3. I'll just read it to you. I'm afraid lest the serpent, that is Satan, deceived Eve by his craftiness your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. The simplicity and purity of coming to me every day for intimacy. 
getting a hold of my heart, sitting before me in my presence and listening to my heartbeat, listening to my word, renewing your mind with truth, going to the secret place. You know, uh, we were on Wednesday at my house, we were just sitting there listening to music and just singing a little bit, but just kind of resting in the presence of God. And some of us felt the presence, some of us didn't. I said, you know what? It doesn't matter. This is why you're alive. You're just doing what you're alive to do. Be in God's presence. And whether we pray for somebody or not, that's fine. But whether we prophesy for somebody or not, whether we, you know, preach uh, or teach or not, that's all good. But that's, that's okay that we've done what we've done. We for, this is the reason why we're alive, okay? Did you guys get what I just meant? You know, if the devil can lead us to this, away from this simple devotion, he knows sooner or later we're going to burn out. And I'm going to close with this. Well, this is pre-closing, okay? Psalms uh, 119.96 I have seen the consummation of all perfection. That's David speaking. He's talking about the new Jerusalem. I've seen the consummation or the fullness of all perfection. He saw through prophetic insight the new Jerusalem. He knew where he was going. And he said this in Psalms 27.4. One thing I desired of the Lord and that I will seek that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now he's not talking about until he dies. He's talking about his life and even after for billions of billions of years in the presence of Almighty God where the veil is taken away, okay? To behold the beauty of the Lord. That's to receive divine information or revelation from Him and to inquire in His temple, to receive instruction from God. This, this statement here, if you want to be a personal one thing like David. Now I gotta tell you, David, God has blessed him. He had a mighty army, okay? This is why he was in his 40s around there. But maybe in his younger years, you know, he, didn't, he couldn't come to this place. He desired God, he probably said, God, I want you, I desire you, I long for you. But it took years of experience for him to come to this one conclusion. This is the one thing that is most important in my life. This is priority in my life. This is what I desire. One thing I desire of the Lord and that I will seek is to dwell in the house of the Lord, the place of his presence, and to behold his beauty and to inquire, to get instruction from him, to be exhilarated, fascinated by him. And to receive instruction from him. This is what I want. This is. Now. You guys. You know. If you have some, a lot of going on. You might be busy. You might have school. How many of you guys know that David is a lot busier than you as king? He had to take care of all his possessions. And all his army. And all the people under him. And yet he can find the place to be in God's presence. You have no excuse. Everybody say I have no excuse. I can do this. But you have to put one first thing first, one thing first. Like Mary of Bethany. And Caroline shared with a dream to me. And she said that in the dream, the Lord spoke to her and said, Mary of Bethany is not really welcome to in my house. That's a sad thing. When we've gotten so busy and so religious in our busyness that we don't even welcome Mary of Bethany, the woman of one thing. The woman of extravagant worship. Let it not be true of us in this house. It's terrible. And I believe that in the dream, God was speaking about the church in general. The vast majority of the body of Christ really don't have time for one thing. They have time for all these other things. And all these activities. And all these programs. 
And all these, all these nine steps, ten steps, twelve steps, all these things you can do to be righteous and to live righteous and to do right. But you know what? The most important thing that's on God's heart in this generation, in this time right now, is that you would slow down your life. You would take some time off and sit before God. You say, sometimes I sit before God and I don't feel nothing. Doesn't mean something didn't happen to you on the inside. And I'll close with this. John 15, 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing. Too many servants in the body. And Lord is looking for friends. Those who like, who long to be intimate with Jesus. Do you know that not every Christian is intimate with God? We were talking about this last Sunday. We're like, how would you feel if your friend only comes to you when he needs something or she needs something? When they need a ride, when they need some money? You'd feel used, right? Then how does God feel when Christians only come to them when they need something? And not for relationship. Not because they really want to go deep with him. They only, they only cry out to him when they're in need, when they're in pain. And they don't come to him because they want and long to be with him in the place of intimacy. How does he feel about that? And it says here, but I've called you friends for all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. Did you know that God does not reveal he doesn't make known those things he's heard from his father to his servants. But he makes known right here, it says, to his friends. He's saying to his disciples, hey, you used to serve me, but I graduated you. Now you're my friends. I'm going to share my heart to you. I'm going to share the future to you. I'm going to take my will for your life and give it to you. I'm going to show you what I'm doing. I'm going to show you exactly what I'm doing. The Bible says God does nothing Unless he reveals it to his servants, the prophets, who are his friends. You know what's going to happen tomorrow? I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do tomorrow. Next year, I'm going to tell you. But I'm not going to tell anybody. I want to tell you because you're my friend. Because you delight in me. Because you want to have communion with me. Because you actually chose to sit still and listen to my voice. You actually chose to go to the secret place, close your door, slow down your life. And sit before me. You actually chose to seek my words and obey my commandment no matter what it costs you. You actually long to bring me joy. And my joy will become your joy. And we are connected as friends. So you're going to know what I'm doing. You're going to know my heart. Because I don't reveal it to people who casually seek me. And are distracted by all and trouble with many things. Do you know how Mary knew that Jesus was going to be crucified? Because he revealed it to her. And that's why she took a bottle of perfume that cost 300 days of wages. Imagine working 300 days of your life, putting all that in a bottle and breaking it before Jesus. Extravagant worship who would do that unless they were truly consumed with love for someone? She just said, I want to show my love to him. Because I know he's revealed to me what he's going to do. And I will express my heart to him. Too many servants and not enough friends. Is there anybody in here tonight who says, you know what? Tonight, if I die, I really don't know that I'm going to God. And I need your prayer. Is anybody in here in that place? So Lord, let your presence fill this house. God, all those here that are uncertain of their origin, Lord, and the place that they're going, Lord, you guys come gather around them and just lay hands on them right now.
come, Lord. Show them right now. Let your presence come. Let your power come. God, I pray that you put a desire in them. To run after you like a deer. A pants for water. Because it's so thirsty. And there in the water, the lion that's chasing them cannot go. The lion that Satan, that lion that goes around seeking who he may devour. He goes around like a lion, but he cannot get them in the place of your presence. Would you take them in your embrace right now? Would you show them that they are forgiven and loved by you? God. And the minute they ask you to embrace them and turn their hearts towards you, Receive your gift, Lord, and confess their sins to you, Lord. You always say yes. You don't cast anyone out. Let your presence come. Let your presence come. Just go lay hands on them. God, and it's not hard. Just the Holy Spirit's going to do it. So, Lord, release your presence on them. Your love and affirmation. I just see the Lord releasing His healing into your hearts. I see the hand of God just touching your hearts. Just, just receive that by faith right now. Just say, Lord, put your hand on my heart. Heal me from my brokenness. God, I, I don't want to be insecure, Lord. I want to know that you are truly my daddy and you love me just the way I am. That you can enjoy me in my brokenness, in my struggle. God, that you like me tonight, Lord. Desires my presence before you, God. My prayers are precious to you, God. God, I pray, God, for a generation that lacks the Father's embrace from their earthly Father, God. God, so many of us here, Lord, don't know what it's like to be embraced by a loving, kind, tender Father. God, even tonight, God, would you wrap yourself around us, Lord? Would you pick us up and tell us you never forsake us? You'll never turn your back on us. You'll never lie to us, Lord. What you say you will do, Lord, you don't break your promises, Lord. Even tonight, God, in this generation that's lacked the Father's heart, God. Would you come and be our daddy? If I just said, Daddy, I need you. I need you to wrap your arms around me. I need you to take me up in your arms. I need you to carry me deep into your heart. Every one of you should pray and pray this. Come on. Let's just release God's presence on one another. Release your presence. God, my heart aches to be loved. Take away the insecurity, Lord. Oh, let me know that I am your son and daughter. I am your daughter. You delight in me. You approve of me. I don't have to perform to be accepted by you, Lord. I am loved for who I am. Say that I am loved by you for who I am. I am cherished by you. I can open my heart to you tonight, Lord. Come Holy Spirit. Father, embrace your children. Holy Spirit, would you awaken love? Would you reveal love in every heart? This is your job. This is what you do best. Come, Holy Spirit. Rise up. Come, Lord. God, on behalf of the fathers that have left their position, Lord, 
and neglected their children.